I'm talking about WH movement and its loss in Chinese, uh, in late archaic Chinese, which is basically the classical period as we see in one. Um, we had a kind of WH fronting where an, a VP internal WH word would move to a position between the verb and the subject. Um, and so what, what we see in one here is just shei, shei shi dai zi. And the shei is the object following the control verb in its canonical word order, but it appears preceding the main verb here. In two, we see that this movement is lost in early middle Chinese of the Han period, basically. And here, very similar example, we have the control verb liang, and then she, the same WH word, uh, and the WH word now is in its base position in the VP. And what I, the main proposal that I'm going to make today is that the WH movement, this WH movement was lost uh, at the same time that morphological marking for focus movement was lost. Uh, the case of WH words like we see in one and two is a little bit special, and I'm going to talk about how that is special later at the, in, later on in the talk. But the main point that I want to make is that changes are going to happen because of changes in functional categories and morphological marking. Uh, the situation is a little bit complicated, so we're going to move on and look at different kinds of WH and focus movement in late archaic Chinese first in section two. And uh, what I'm going to show you is that focused and interrogative objects or VP internal constituents were dislocated to preverbal position within the little VP in this, in this time. If what you're fronting is a referential category, not just a plain bare WH word, then that is going to be marked with genitive case in the landing site. And this is the morphological marker that I'm focusing on in this talk. So first we're gonna look at completely non-referential simplex WH words that don't have this marker. And as I showed you just a moment ago, these are going to front to a position between the subject and the verb. So very famous example in 3A here, this wu shei qi. So wu is the subject, shei is the object, qi is the verb. The second clause is qi tian, hu qi is the verb and tian is a just a, a canonical object in its base position in the VP. So you can see that this is basically normally a VO language and the WH words are in a non-canonical position. Uh, same thing for the second example, so we'll move on. All right, so now I wanna show you that these things actually do move out of the big VP. They precede certain kinds of functional categories like in 4A and B, we have uh, so um, preceding something that looks like a, a control verb. It may be a restructuring verb, it may not be a restructuring verb. Nobody's quite sure. But in any case, the shei yu xiang has moved out of its base position, which is in the lower VP. And then moving over this gan in B. Uh, the gan, which is again either some kind of auxiliary or an adverbial or a control verb, it's hard to say, but um, in any case, the she is moving out of the VP where it's generated. And I really want to draw your attention to see this ke bu wei ku, the second clause here. The WH word is moving over negation. And I'm going to be using this as a diagnostic. Uh, for diagnosing landing sites of other elements later. So remember that these WH words are going to jump over this negator. In five, we see a uh, movement of an object controller uh, over the uh, control verb. We just looked at 5A, 5B is a pretty much identical, it is identical situation. So I will not explain those examples again. And 6A, or sorry, 6A and B, 
is movement from what looks like a PP, so movement of the object of a preposition. So this 6A, for instance, Wang Shei, Shei Yu Wei Shan, so with whom will you do good deeds kind of thing. Uh, so the Shei is moving um, out of the PP, uh, its canonical position would be following the preposition. This is a prepositional language across the board in this period. Now, um, the next thing that needs to be clarified though is that it is not the case that the object WH word is moving into the CP layer. That is not the case and it is easily demonstrated. So for instance, you couldn't analyze the subject as being in a topic position and then the WH word moves to a focus position um, in the, the left periphery. That's not what's happening. And the reason that we know that is because there are different positions for subject WH words as opposed to object WH words. So seven is showing us that subject WH words precede certain elements in the TP layer. For instance, this temporal aspectual marker uh, jiang, uh, so jiang in 7a, and then we have an adverb in 7b, du, right? Du now these same markers, jiang and du, precede the landing site for object wh words, like in 8. So now we have an object in 8a following jiang, wo jiang he qiu. And in B, uh, uh, this is Yue. I always want to read this as Shui, but Yue Wu Jun Hu. So the objects follow uh, these uh, elements um, in their landing sites. So the way that I, the analysis that I've developed over the course of, well, you can see about a decade here uh, at least, is shown in nine and still basically the same analysis. And the way I view this now is the motivation for WH fronting is I'm treating this as a kind of agnostic movement. The WH word to be interpreted correctly in this period, it wants to be in a local, a local relation with the interrogative feature on C, on matrix C. So it's going to undergo some kind of agnostic movement. Well some kind of movement, which is agnostic. It floats up to the edge of the local phase. And once it's there, sees the feature on C, then it's happy. It just stays there, the derivation converges. Now you might ask, well, heck, if it's gone that far, why doesn't it go all the way up to spec CP? Very simple answer to that question. This is my, uh, my passion of late and the main focus of the 2019 paper there was strict locality between subjects and non-subjects. Only subjects could undergo movement into the CP layer in this period, uh, in this language. And VP internal arguments could not move over the subject in a matrix clause. It could not compete with the subject for the nominative case position, in other words. So the object could only move to the edge of the cause medial phase. And that's why the interrogative object just sits there and is happy as long as it sees the Q feature on um, the higher phase head. And you'll note that the C and the T are not split. They do split under certain circumstances in this language, but not necessarily. That split has to be forced. And this is also my passion of late. Most of my recent work is on uh, feature inheritance or its lack. Uh, in all of the languages that I work with. Okay, so that was the simple WH words. Now, um, if we have a WH phrase, now we get a slightly different situation. So as I said, the facts are a little bit complicated, but all of these constructions are related to each other and that relationship is going to play out in interesting ways um, as change takes place later on. So if we have phrasal categories, as in, let's just look at 10a. So fu jin, uh, so the jin as, as a subject here. Uh, he yan jie you. 
So he yan now is a phrasal category. So what uh, satisfaction would they have or could they have? Um, and the crucial thing here, two things, the interrogative constituent precedes the verb, obviously, but it's also followed by what I gloss as a genitive particle. And this genitive particle plays an extremely important role in the grammar of this language and also um, in how things change later down the road. So all these examples are very similar. Phrasal WH constituent followed by the genitive marker followed by the VP. Now, this genitive marker, and you might recall that this genitive marker does not occur with non-phrasal WH words. It does not. And I think this is related to the historical origin of the genitive marker. So the genitive marker grammaticalized from a demonstrative, demonstrative pronoun, a distal demonstrative pronoun. Um, and it became a personal pronoun and it also became a genitive marker and it was used in both of these functions in late archaic Chinese. And you can think of this grammaticalization process, grammaticalization process that we see in other languages, Altaic languages, for instance. So it's something like John, his hat becomes John's hat, right? It's typical grammaticalization scenario for a genitive particle, I think. In other words, this thing at that time before it was reanalyzed as a genitive particle was a resumptive pronoun, a resumptive possessive pronoun. But so a resumptive possessive pronoun is going to resume something that is referential and definite. And this is what we do see this in the early texts when the grammaticalization process is underway or has just taken hold. So you only see the genitive marker with definite, with definite um, constituents. So then you're not ever going to see it with an indefinite, completely non-referential WH word. So the genitive marker shows up with these phrasal ones because they have a referential component, the noun following the WH word. But with the simplex WH words, the genitive marker never shows up. Uh, that's perfectly reasonable given the historical origin of the genitive marker. And here in 11, we see the genitive marker functioning as a genitive marker. We see it as a possessor, marking a possessor in 11a. Zhu Ho is the possessor and their land, the land of the feudal lords. We also see genitive marking in B here, all non-assertive complement, not only complement clauses, but embedded clauses with the subject, mark their subjects with genitive case. So here we have a factive complement with a genitive subject. Now, very interestingly, we also have genitive marking on fronted objects that are focused. And that is the subject of 12. The first three examples show genitive marking following a focused object. The fourth example shows actually a, a proximal demonstrative pronoun. This kind of gives away the, uh, the origin of the genitive marker as a resumptive pronoun as well. But I agree with Barbara Meister and she in her 2010 paper has done extensive work on object focus constructions. And the genitive marker has is no longer a resumptive pronoun in this period, but the proximal marker here in D is still a resumptive pronoun. So I just wanted to point this out to you because it will show up again, but the main focus for the moment is the genitive marking. So I want to look at a couple of examples. The object focus constructions look like when 12a, we have the subject. Uh, so wu wei zi zhi yuan. So the subject is wu wei is the, this is a focus marker grammaticalized from a copula. Then the focused object zi, then genitive marking, and then the verb. One more thing I will draw your attention to is, and this was also pointed out by Barbara Meister Ernst in her paper, no functional elements appear between the fronted object and the verb. And functional elements like uh, negation, for instance, I told you negation is a diagnostic 
and we see that in C, that's going to occur before the focus marker itself. So we have the uh, jiang, this temporal aspectual marker, bu, the negator, and then the focus marker and everything else. So the negation never appears in a lower position here. Uh, so this is showing us, uh, again, that the, these focused objects are in a lower position than the fronted WH words. Fronted WH words could jump over negation. So the analysis here, the key things here are low position and the genitive marking. And my recent analysis, which in some ways is similar to Barbara's earlier analysis, but with quite a lot of um, revision in order to fit it into my world view. So I'm analyzing the focus marker, the COP copula thing as a phase head. So in this case, it occurs in the lower phase head. And now the feature inheritance is going to take place because the case feature is going to be dropped down uh, to the landing site for the object. So the object is going to move, the focused object is going to move into the spec of the genitive phrase and be marked with the genitive case. Now you may ask, so why is it important that it gets case? And I'm going to say that this is a licensing issue which can also be restated as a labeling issue. And we know that in languages typically that have object dislocations, dislocated objects have have to be marked somehow. And it's been proposed, uh, one person who's proposed this is Mamoru Saito, for instance, that overt case marking is a way of um, taking care of labeling issues for, uh, for arguments, for instance. His implementation, Im implementation is slightly different from mine, but uh, the overt marking for me is related to labeling. And he also draws this connection. If the object is in its canonical position inside the VP, then it doesn't need this overt marking. So it does need it if it's dislocated. And that's why I think the object, the referential focused object moves to a lower position because it's going to move to the inherited position because this is the case position. Uh, and this is necessary for licensing, AKA labeling. Whereas the pure interrogative marker doesn't need this because it's not referential. It never occurred with this presumptive pronoun. It only needs to be identified as interrogative. And so it floats all the way to the edge of the lower phase. So this accounts for the two different landing sites and the, the, the when the genitive marker does and does not show up. Now, another reason to analyze the, the genitive marker as, um, as a case marker is because it does not show up with focused subjects. So in 14 here, when the subject is focused, uh, we have again, we'll look at 14a here. We actually have two positions for the subject. The subject is kind of split here. So we have first a kind of aboutness topic, this zhu hou, denoting a superset. Then the focus marker, wei wo, the focus subject, so that we is the, sub, the subset of the topic, uh, and then the VP. So we're the only ones among the zhu hou who serve the jin. And another thing that's very important is to talk about negation. In 14C, 张人皆喜, 为子产不顺, so the focus subject precedes negation, whereas focused objects never precede negation. This shows you that the subject is moving into a higher position. The analysis of this, so this is the first example we looked at with the superset appearing before the focus copula. Again, the focus marker is in the phase head, the C phase head. And then we have the topic in spec CP. Now we have feature inheritance. So we have a divided position. We have the, the superset subject in spec CP and then the focus subject in spec TP. But the genitive case marker crucially does not show up because the subject is in a position where it's going to get nominative case anyway, which is the C slash TP layer. So this is more evidence for analyzing the 
and focus, focus object constructions as a case marker, because it only shows up when it's needed, and that's for fronted objects, but not for fronted subjects. The subject's going to get nominative case anyway. All right, so we have uh, non-referential WH words float up to the edge of little VP where they're visible to interrogative features on C. They do not get genitive marking because they just need to be interrogative. The phrasal WH constituents are marked with genitive case uh, because they have a referential component, so they need the case marking and referential focused objects get genitive case because they also need this exceptional case licensing. Now, this situation is going to change in rather noticeable and interesting ways in early Middle Chinese. So um, things are going to happen because the genitive case marking gets lost. So I'm going to go through the rest of the paper rather quickly because I think time is progressing here. But it's with the introduction that I've provided you, I think it'll be fairly straightforward. So all we're seeing in section 3.1 is genitive marking gets lost. So the archaic example in 16a, genitive on the possessor, very similar example in the middle Chinese example in B, no genitive marker and various kinds of embedded clauses that were nominalized in the archaic period. We see the genitive marking on the embedded subject as a sentential subject in 17a in the archaic period, but in Middle Chinese in B, no genitive marking. And this example in 17b was clearly copied from 17a but they decided to normalize the example to their own grammatical norms, drop the genitive case and some other functional categories as well along the way. Other uh, non-assertive embedded clauses, the archaic examples in 18 all have genitive marking on the subject, but in 19, I've bolded here for you the higher verbs inside the following complement clauses, we see no genitive marking for the Middle Chinese embedded subjects. So genitive case marking is clearly lost. Moving on to section two, well, the MP focus fronting for um, object MPs is likewise lost from the language. There really isn't any evidence, at least in the text that I consulted, for this being a productive grammatical process in this period. The first evidence that I'm showing you comes from uh, a, um, an, a commentary, actually. Commentary written in the early Middle Chinese period, in the Han period, which is basically explaining the funny object-focused fronting construction of antiquity to people of the Han period, so still over two millennia ago, and telling them, well, you know, back then they took the object sometimes and they put it in front of the verb, but really, guys, in order to understand this, just take the object and move it back around following the verb, and then you can make sense of it. So both the examples in 20 and 21 that's what the author of the commentary is telling you. So clearly, speakers of this time no longer had the fronting in their grammar. Now, it is true that there are some examples in the text that I consulted with this historical chronicle, this Shi Qi of the early Han period. There are some examples of object fronting, but they all employ the, demonst the, the proximal demonstrative xi. None of them use the genitive marker, qi. And the examples that I found, some of them are outright copied from earlier texts. So they're just taken from archaic Chinese verbatim or nearly verbatim. Others are, I think, very plausibly copied, but I didn't find the sources. In any case, I won't take you through these examples, it's just these clearly are copied. So there's very little evidence, if any evidence in this text, that object fronting for focus was still a part of the spoken grammar at this time. 
Okay, so I think that object focused fronting is gone from the language uh, in this period as well. So now this is the final section, I promise that uh, we're going to look at what happens with WH movement. So this situation is slightly more complex. So object focus fronting is gone, concomitant with the loss of genitive case marking. Now phrasal WH movement, which also occurred with genitive case marking in the classical period, this also is gone. So now we see just pure WH and C2, and those are the examples in 23. So we just look at A here, this yo he yuan hu. So yo is the verb, he yuan is the WH phrase. And we just have VO order, WH and C2, just like modern Chinese. But when we get to the simple WH words, well, the situation is slightly more complicated. So it seems that we didn't just have an across the board loss of WH fronting, because here what we have is um, we still have movement. So in 20, now all the examples in 24, we're moving a WH word around the main verb. So he huan, right? Or he xiao. Uh, so we still have this WH movement. We didn't just get reanalyzed to WH and C2. But recall that the simplex WH words never occurred with the genitive particle. So the loss of the genitive particle might affect this movement in a different way. And what I'm going to suggest here today is that the uh, movement to the phase edge was reanalyzed as just head movement. So the first thing that we see is in, well, the next thing that we see here is that there, the, the, the target landing site for this movement is in a lower position. It's not as high as it used to be. So in the classical period, like in 25A, we had movement over an auxiliary or a higher verb, but we lose that 25B and C in middle Chinese, we have movement to a position around the the main verb, well, not the main verb, the embedded verb, but not over the higher verb. Um, and in object control uh, situations, we have what looks like full-fledged WH and C2. So we don't have any movement at all here. And since I'm suggesting this is head movement, we can explain this as the examples in 25 B and C, we have incorporation to the lower verb. But if we analyze uh, the object controllers as being merged in a specifier position, well, then maybe it's more difficult for them to undergo uh, incorporation to the verb since they're not base generated in a complement position. So then they revert to WH and C2. We also lose fronting from a PP. So um, the, in the archaic period, we had movement around the preposition, but in early Middle Chinese, we, we don't have movement around the preposition anymore. So if the reanalysis was in the direction of head movement from the complement of a verb to the verb, then that accounts for the lack of fronting in a PP. So the possible analysis that I'm suggesting for you today is that the phrasal movement of the, the referential or phrasal WH movement is lost altogether when the genitive marking is lost because those were erstwhile genitive marked in their landing site. So the genitive marking removed that trigger for acquiring the movement strategy. Um, but the non-referential WH movement had a different motivation, which was just to get into a position where it was visible to the interrogative feature on C. Uh, so that's not directly related to the genitive marking, but after the movement, other focus fronting was lost, then this did have an influence on movement. So movement was retained, but it's not the same kind of movement that it was before. And it's definitely a step in the direction of full-fledged WH and C2, which is what we have now. Okay, so this is a kind of intermediate stage, perhaps. Okay, so that's it. Sorry if I...